Hi, John. Can you Hi, hear us? How are you? I'm great. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Never a problem. Always welcome. Sorry, it's under these circumstances. Me too. Me too. So, um, you know, you have a very unique perspective on the current situation with Julian Assange and the possibility, the possibilities that he faces should he be expelled from the embassy. I just want to kind of open the floor to you and just ask for your sentiments or thoughts on the latest developments and what could come next. I'm actually not as pessimistic as I was 24 hours ago. Uh, 24 hours ago, I thought, well, this is, this is what we've been fearing all along. It's finally going to come to pass, and now we have to come up with a strategy. But the more I thought about it today, and I thought about it all day today, I thought this is actually the perfect time for us to make that argument that Julian is a journalist. Julian is a publisher. Uh, Julian is not the kind of person that the Espionage Act was written for. He's not a spy. He's a working journalist doing his job. Um, my co-host on my radio show, Brian Becker, said today, let's look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, Fox, and MSNBC. Uh, they're often wrong, and sometimes they're very wrong. WikiLeaks has literally never been wrong. That's journalism. You don't see WikiLeaks having to issue corrections or apologies or retractions because they're never wrong. That's just simply journalism. So if the US government has made up its mind that it wants to extradite Julian and charge him with these very serious felonies, and I, I still hold out some hope that that's not the case, maybe we need to start thinking about issues like jury nullification, where we can influence a jury, especially a jury in a very highly educated area like Washington, DC, so that regardless of what the law says, regardless of how the law is written, regardless of what the prosecutors are going to tell a jury, that jury will go into its jury room and will conclude that the law is just simply wrong. And so it doesn't matter what the law says. You know, I say all the time that when I was at the CIA, the culture was such that we were always taught that everything is a shade of gray. And in many cases, that's just simply not true. Some things are black and white. They're right and wrong. This is just wrong. And I think that there are enough people out there who are going to agree that this is wrong. This is political, it's a vendetta. Uh, the deck has already been stacked and, uh, and they're just not going to stand for it. So I feel a lot better about this today than I did yesterday. Uh, maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm naive, but I still actually feel like I can put my faith in the, in the jury system provided that the jury is able to get the information necessary to make a just decision. Now, that is a huge caveat that I think is a, it cannot be um, overstated, uh, the accurate information that they would have to receive. And on previous vigils, you've mentioned that uh, the fact that if Assange is extradited to the US and if he's prosecuted, uh, prosecuted, he will very likely not have any access to the information and evidence used against him. Even yes. his lawyers would have very little access to that. And that's an issue that I wanted you to comment on further this evening because I've seen so many supporters of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks who tell me, oh, bring him to the US so that he can have a fair trial and get the evidence out into the public arena. And I always respond with your quote about that. So please explain to the audience again, what would be the reality if he were to arrive in the US? In a national security case, especially in the Eastern District of Virginia, which is where Julian apparently would be tried, uh, there is no such thing as a fair trial. We have a law here in the United States called uh, CIPA, the Classified Information Protection Act. And what that means in practical terms is that if you've been charged with a national security crime where you are accused of having exposed classified information, what the government calls national defense information, you are just simply not permitted to, to offer that information up in your own defense in court. 
there's a process by which the prosecutors can do it. They can declassify it solely for the purpose of prosecuting you. And that's what they did in my case. They said, we have declassified this information solely for the purpose of prosecuting Mr. Kiriakou. They would do that with Julian, but they wouldn't declassify enough information for him to actually defend himself. They would declassify only that information necessary to prosecute him. And so when the Justice Department invokes SIPA, the Classified Information Protection Act, what they do is they literally clear the courtroom of everybody but the prosecutors, the defense attorneys and the defendant, the judge, the clerk, and the court reporter. That's it. The courtroom is empty. And then they bring in a technical team to come and sweep for bugs. And at that point, Julian's attorneys would make a motion, or as in my case, 70 motions, to declassify the documents necessary for Julian to mount a defense. In my case, we had blocked off two days for these hearings, two full days. We walked into the courtroom, uh, SIPA was invoked, the courtroom was cleared, and they, they literally, they physically lock the door. And then the judge said, I'm going to save everybody a lot of time. And I am going to deny all 70 of these motions. She said, you just simply do not need this information to defend yourself. And then that was it. And so as we were walking out of the courtroom, I said to my lead attorney, what just happened in there? And he said, we just lost the case. That's what happened. He said, we have no defense. And it was true. I said, now what do we do? He said, now we talk about a plea. And so my point is that that's not justice, not at all. That's Washington area justice. That's national security justice. You know, there's an old Richard Pryor joke that you go to court and you're looking for justice and that's what you find, just us. Right. Uh, and that, that's what I fear is gonna happen with, uh, with Julian. Julian's going to end up in the Eastern District of Virginia looking for justice. And the only, the only thing that's there is just us outside with our signs demanding that he get a fair trial that'll never come. And that's why I think we need to fall back again on this issue of jury nullification. And jury nullification would not be possible, could not be successful, unless our voices are heard. Right? Right. Look at it this way. <clears throat> Uh, a jury consultant, actually quite a famous jury consultant. He was the jury consultant for the O.J. Simpson case and for the, uh, the Trayvon Martin case and, and William Kennedy Smith. He was my jury consultant. And he told me, if you were in any other district in America, I'd say, let's go for it. We're going to win this thing. But the Eastern District of Virginia... Your jury is going to be made up of people who are members of or who have relatives who are members of the CIA, the FBI, the Defense Department, the Department of Homeland Security, and intelligence community contractors. You don't have a chance, is what he told me. Well, in my case, he was right. In Julian's case, I think that's wrong. Because Julius is famous enough or infamous enough, depending on what side of the issue you fall on, that he commands attention in the media. We can use that ability to attract attention, to turn the debate so that our voices are heard saying over and over and over again that Julian is a journalist and that WikiLeaks is a journalistic organization. All we need is one juror to agree with us one and then it ends how do you how would you advise our audience and you know participants in this vigil to bring that type of possibility about should sort of should us aren't be extradited to the u.s you know what can we do to make those our voices heard on that a lot of things i think uh, for those of us who have the ability to um to get published we need to write like we've never written before uh, Could not and, agree and, more on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not just for, you know, for those outlets that we're so comfortable with, where we all just sit around agreeing with each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, reader supported news, consortium news, truth dig, truth out. We need to get out there into the Wall Street Journal. 
and the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Washington Times. We need to form alliances with conservatives because, you know, the, the, the ideological spectrum is not a straight line. It's a circle. And there's a point where the right and the left meet. And that is where civil liberties are involved. And so we need to form a strategic alliance with those on the right who love civil liberties, those li libertarians who understand that the Constitution was written to protect people like Julian Assange and, and organizations exactly. like WikiLeaks. So we need to write, and those of us who don't write or can't write or get published or whatever need to be not just in the streets, but in front of that courthouse. You know that as soon as Julian arrives in the United States, every news outlet in America is going to be in front of that courthouse and they're going to be broadcasting all day every day we need to get in front of those cameras look you know juries are going to be warned not to read articles about the case not to watch tv about the case this is going to be such a high profile case that that's going to be impossible and so absolutely they are they are going to hear what we have to say we just have to keep up the pressure and let me let me backtrack a little bit too. You know, it, it's not over till the fat lady has sung. And so we need to exert as much pressure as we possibly can on the Ecuadorian government. Uh, they cannot be allowed to get away with this. This nonsense, forgive me, I haven't watched the last uh, the last six hours, but this this nonsense problem. that that they may try to argue that they've somehow negotiated the notion that Julian wouldn't face a death penalty charge. This isn't a death penalty charge in any case under the sun. The only way this would be a death penalty charge would have been if the United States was in a state of declared war, which we haven't been since December 8th, 1941, and Julian were caught uh, providing aid and comfort to the enemy. So don't treat us like we're stupid and that we somehow think this is a death penalty case. This isn't a death penalty case. What this is, is this is a case of the Ecuadorians being sellouts. This is a case of the Ecuadorians wanting American money and more favorable trade uh, 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 negotiations. or Debt or relief. Debt relief. Yeah. Right. Whatever it is. Visas. Who knows? Uh, this is about Lenin Moreno being a, 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 a two-faced traitor. I hate to say it. This is a guy that we put our trust in, which was very foolish. Uh, and so we have to stand up to the Ecuadorians and, uh, and make sure that they understand that this is, this is not acceptable. Currying favor with the Trump administration or even the Obama administration before it, it's just not going to go. It's not going to fly. Absolutely. And I do want to remind our audience that your refer of your reference to the fact that, you know, at the beginning of, of uh, his administration and, and when he was running for, uh, for office, WikiLeaks supporters were, were fully behind Moreno because he was viewed as the successor to Correa who would protect Assange. So just in that's case exactly some viewers weren't aware of that. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I think that, that has been one of the elements of this whole scenario that has been so shocking. And, and you know, you say it's a great you know, sentiment that, you know, we're not stupid, that, that the death penalty issue is, is, you know, is a lark. But, it, you know, the same can be said absolutely about all of the allegations that Lennon Bruno has made against Julian Assange in this, this oh. INA paper scandal. Oh, it's listen, ridiculous. I had to laugh out loud today when I read this, this article in CNBC where Moreno made the, the requisite accusations about about the leak of the papers, and which was just simply factually not true, right? Exactly. It, this came from a legislator in the Ecuadorian uh, uh, parliament. But then he complained that Julian somehow uh, photographed his food and his daughter's dancing and the interior of his bedroom. And it's like, buddy, you're confusing Julian with the CIA. The CIA is bugging your bedroom and taking pictures of your kids and your food, not Julian Assange. He doesn't so, even yeah. have internet access. Like he's he's the one person in the world who couldn't hack anybody right now. Right. So, yeah. Right. And yeah. Moreno's the one that knows that more than anyone. Of course. It's all a lie. It's all a lie and it's all to twist public opinion. Well, we can do that too. We can fight back too. Absolutely. Uh, and I think it's great, a great point that people who maybe are not published or who don't write, uh, you know, use their bodies to show up, it, you know, 
Use your bodies. Yeah. And if you're you're not in the Washington area, by God, go on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. You have friends, you have relatives, you have followers. Make sure that they know your position on WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and try to convince them of, of the justice of this cause. You know, this is one of those... I I really don't believe that I'm overstating this. This is one of those once in a generation events like like Sacco and Vanzetti or the Rosenbergs where we really do need to pull together and point out an injustice and fight to correct it. I couldn't agree more. I actually had a very similar conversation before this vigil began saying exactly the same thing. This is one of those moments where we, you choose what side of history you're on. And a decade, a generation from now, people will be looking back at this, I think, similarly to the way that they've looked at, you know, Susie Dawson's example of the Nelson Mandela uh, support and movement, the civil rights movement, things like that, where there is this really clear demarcation between right and wrong. Yes. And this is on the side of right. And as you say, people should be convincing their friends and family of that, for sure. I, I think that's it right there. So uh, what can, I, from your perspective, as somebody who was, you know, a CIA analyst, can you describe to us maybe, uh, is, you know, some of the, the, from your perspective, the way in which this, these allegations from Moreno have been a farce and or just the way that the, the, the kind of psychological warfare that has been waged against the public uh, when it comes to Assange, which is why we don't see the equivalent of the Yellow Vest protests, which have gone on for 20 weeks with thousands and thousands of people participating. We don't see that at the Ecuadorian embassy. So, you know, if you could comment on, on that psychological warfare that has achieved that, uh, that would be, I think, fantastic to hear. Sure. You know, I think that operationally, it's better for the CIA the longer Julian remains in the embassy. The CIA doesn't care about prosecutions. The CIA cares about sending a message. The message is, we have kept this man in what is in effect solitary confinement for the last six and a half years, and there's nothing he can do about it. The FBI, sure, they care about about prosecutions because that's how they get promoted. For the CIA, it's about making an example of people. In my own case, the the point wasn't to see how many years in prison I could get. The point was to frighten anybody else who was even considering blowing the whistle on waste, fraud, abuse, or illegality. It's the same thing with Julian. You know, Julian did something that worked. He created something that actually worked. Um, He created something that actually protected its sources and that actually exposed war crimes and crimes against humanity. And so they had to make sure that that ended. So what do you do when you're confronted with someone that you need to make an example of who has taken up residence uh, in in an embassy belonging to a country that's actually a weak country? then you start using some muscle. And that muscle in this case is economic. You know, it's like, it's like Lenin Moreno thinks that nobody reads, nobody among us reads the Wall Street Journal. That we didn't see the article about how he practically got on his knees and he begged the Trump White House for an increase in both uh, uh, US uh, AID aid and uh, uh, better tariffs so that they could export more goods to the United States. I read the Wall Street Journal. I saw that article. Uh, This guy's supposed to be a communist. He's supposed to be a a, 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 liberator and, and, uh, and somebody who values human rights and civil rights and civil liberties, and he's not. It's all about the money. So it's hard, sorry, it's hard to, it's hard to confront the US government when it's not acting in a case like this as a monolithic organization. The CIA has its own uh, interests, the FBI and the Justice Department have its own interests. And to tell you the truth, I think the White House and even the Department of State being led by Mike Pompeo have their own interests. Uh, And so we have to fight them individually along with fighting the Ecuadorians. And you know, also remember, there there are a lot of us Uh, from all around the world. I mean, how many people 
watch these vigils. It's thousands and thousands of people. Every time I do one of these, I'm flabbergasted by the number of people around the world who actually sit and watch these and comment on them. Well, that tells me we have a lot of soldiers on our side as well. And so if they believe that it's time to squeeze this pimple, we can be there squeezing back. Absolutely. And I think uh, to your point about the fact that they're not just seeking a prosecution, but they're trying to make an example of people mm -hmm. like Julian Assange, of yourself, of Chelsea Manning. I think that that is, is really the principal reason that you don't see a flood of, of people following you, following Chelsea Manning in the same sense or in an analogous sense to the way that you see maybe a flood of, of women coming forward in the, after, in the Weinstein uh, scandal. When one woman comes forward and says, this happened to me and the other women that know about that and also experienced it flood forward. I think what you're describing is exactly why we don't see that. And it's a New York Times reporter told me that on the day of my arrest, every national security source that the New York Times had went completely silent. That's exactly what they wanted to happen. No question. I just think the impact of that can't be overstated. And I think that that point needs to be needs to be made to people that there are other people like yourself that are within these agencies that have a conscience, but that have been scared and, and terrorized into silence by these examples. Especially when the, uh, the oversight system doesn't work. <clears throat> you know, I, I use Tom Drake as an example all the time. I'm going to do it again. Tom Drake did everything perfectly by the book. He did everything the way we're all taught to do. If you witness evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety, you go to your immediate supervisor. If you don't get satisfaction there, you go to your supervisor's supervisor, and then to the inspector general, and then the general counsel. In the case of NSA being a Department of Defense agency, you then go to the Department of Defense uh, inspector general. If you get no satisfaction there, you go to either the House or the Senate uh, Oversight Committee. In that case, the Intelligence Committee. That's exactly what Tom Drake did. And he was charged with nine felonies, including seven counts of espionage when he never, ever provided classified information to any journalist. But it doesn't matter because even though, even though the charges against Tom were all dropped, the government declared victory because they ruined him and they made an example of him. So it silenced anybody else at NSA who was thinking going forward. Ed Snowden said that without Tom Drake, there would have been no Ed Snowden. That's the exception rather than the rule. No question at all. I think that the, um, especially, and now not only with Ed Snowden and his, you know, um, being stranded in Russia, I, I can't imagine the people that are inside these agencies that would want to come forward and what they would consider, you know, in, in um, you know, weighing that, measuring that choice and basically giving up their entire lives for that moral decision. But, um, so, yeah. So what can the public audience do to support people who, or support um, not only the whistleblowers who have come forward and who have been prosecuted and persecuted as a result, but also the potential for others to come forward? Well, one of the things is to participate in events like this. Uh, this has such a broad reach that, you know, it's events like this that make would-be whistleblowers know that they aren't alone that there's a community that supports them and would automatically uh, come to their aid. So that helps a lot. And like I said a few minutes ago, be active on social media, uh, pushing this narrative. Uh, there's something that's actually a little more practical too. Uh, and that is we need to start thinking about raising some money uh, for Julian's defense. There are some lawyers in Washington, there are a half a dozen that come to mind just off the top of my head who are legal titans in this city. And they are the best attorneys money could buy. Uh, there are a couple in particular who are great if you're guilty and you wanna negotiate the best deal. There are a couple who are great if you're innocent and you wanna to go to jury and you wanna win this thing. So we need to think about getting Julian the 
best legal team that money could possibly buy. This is not a case where you need one or two attorneys to go up there and read their speeches and you know object and do whatever it is attorneys do. We need a team of a dozen of the best legal minds in Washington. And I think we're rapidly approaching that. Absolutely. And I've just been um, busily grabbing the uh, link to the defense fund of Julian Assange and the page where people can donate. And I've just thrown that in, into chat just on that note. Because, yeah, I think that, you know, there are, there are a number of different ways that you can uh, donate to WikiLeaks. And, you know, you can go to WikiLeaks.org, you can buy from their shop. But of, there, are, there is this separate site, uh, justiceforassange.com, where the, you can donate specifically uh, to Assange's legal defense, which, as you point out, is critical at this time. I'm going to go on the site right now as we speak. Okay. Yep, there it is. Yes. Uh, if you want, we could go there and I can share a screen just to show people what it looks like. Yep, I'm on wikileaks.org. The other one, tell me the other one again. It's justice for yep. the number four assange.com. Yep. I will throw that into my browser and just bring it up for people briefly because I've had, when I've shared this before, I have had people say to me, well, that's not WikiLeaks's site. So is it safe or is this a scam site? I just want people to know that this is actually a legitimate website. One second. Good. Okay. So here we see this page. This is the justiceforassange.com website. The homepage is over here, but this is specifically the donate page. So this is, it's really as simple as that. You just click to donate. Uh, the, the website in general though has a lot, especially for independent journalists, has a lot of information that is incredibly useful and that you never see in establishment press. Um, it's so, I would urge people to not only donate, but to explore this website and use it as am use the information in, in sites like this as ammunition in the fight to correct the record when it comes to Assange, because, you know, it's a wealth of information that is just waiting to be used. So, but I will end the share screen, but I just wanted to show people that so they know that this isn't some sort of scam. Yep. Excellent. That's what we need. Yeah, I think that, that that point can't be made enough. I think that we definitely don't, we don't emphasize donating um, too much because obviously a lot of people out there in the public are struggling, you know, financially and all of that. But I think that we can't just leave that by the wayside either. We have to encourage people to make that concrete, tangible donation, um, you know, and people do ask, like, what can I do? I feel powerless. Um, I want to support them, but I don't know how. And if you don't, if you feel unable to express your voice, then that is one way. Uh, donating is definitely a way to financially kind of raise your voice. And, you know, looking at the uh, at the WikiLeaks uh, shop, too, there's a whole lot of cool stuff on there. Go ahead and spend 10 or 20 or 30 dollars. It's all for a great cause. Absolutely. I, I, I think that uh, some of the, the sentiments of uh, people like Caitlin Johnstone and yourself, I feel like we need to somehow crowdsource, uh, you know, making that into, um, you know, stamped like uh, sentiments that are on things like mugs, shirts, et cetera, et cetera, and raise money that way. But that was literally an off the cuff idea I had earlier today. But, um, but yeah, I think You're that, it, yeah, go ahead. Elizabeth, at the, at the CIA, we used to sell coffee mugs that <laughs> that were they, on the coffee mugs, they said, admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. And it was kind of a joke, but it was kind of not a joke. And they were by far the most popular coffee mugs in the whole place. Everybody had them on their desks. We could do the same thing here and use that money to buy the best lawyers in Washington for Julian. There would be nothing better than to have that actually work and to do that. I think uh, I think it's really interesting that whole concept of plausible deniability just summed up in a mug that people are actually <laughs> buying. That's hysterical. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you and and our last guest, Margaret Kimberly, are both um, in in a positive mood. I think that 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 that's the absolute best state that we can be in right now. Uh, as we watch mm -hmm. things unfold and as we really do hope, not just based on like blind faith, but as we really hope that the attention we are collectively bringing to this issue will make a difference and protect Assange from being expelled from the embassy and hopefully would make a difference in, in any prosecution that might happen down the road. But I was heartened this morning, and, and Jill Laurie and I discussed this actually, I, I was heartened 
when I saw the Ecuadorian government um, back off a little bit saying that no, no decision had been made. The information's not correct. I think a decision had been made. I think the outcry was so great that they were taken aback by it. And, uh, and so they had to put the brakes on things. And to me, yeah, that's, yeah. that's exactly what we need to be doing. It worked. Yeah, and thank you for raising that point because I think that there is a danger after an immediate response like this vigil and you know the press uh, congregating outside the embassy and all of that, you know, some people, whether they're trolls or earnest, whatever, they will accuse WikiLeaks and the rest of us of engaging in like a, a boy who cried wolf scenario. But I think you've just answered that in that, you know, really, it's not that at all. It's the fact that this response has prevented the plan that had been in place from, from happening. I think so. I think so. And I think that if it's only this continued response that will continue to prevent it from happening. So what, you know, this vigil will end on Monday or, so, or late, late on Sunday. What should we all be trying to do in the, the days after the vigil ends and to make sure that the eyes remain on the embassy and we don't just allow this to happen like next weekend instead of this weekend, for example? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, that this notion of taking to the streets, we need to begin it now and not let up. We need to, at least here in the Washington area, we need to be picketing the Ecuadorian embassy uh, downtown here. And we need to be writing and giving interviews and talking. And we can't let people forget about Julian's predicament. We can't, we can't let people forget that, that his freedom is hanging by a thread here. And it's gonna be decided by who knows? People behind closed doors in the, you know, the dark halls of the intelligence community or the federal law enforcement community. We just have to keep shouting and pushing and, and making sure that this stays in the news. Finally, there was some mainstream press coverage. You know, it's a shame that it had to be bad news that brought the mainstream media out. But maybe we can still capitalize on that. Absolutely. And I think that another example of that success is, is the fact that Chelsea Manning, although she is still imprisoned and very unfairly imprisoned, she has been, uh, you know, taken out of solitary confinement. And I think yes. without the efforts of her support, te support team and the legion of supporters who um, raised their voices in her defense, I don't think that that would have happened. So. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Yes. So. So I think that that, and I think it's something that, you know, we discussed with Margaret earlier, that is an example of the fact that the, the you know, the voices raised in support aren't just blowing into the wind, that, that it does make a difference. But, um, you know, do you have any other, um, you know, issues that you think need to be discussed? For example, the fact that, uh, just the fact that so few journalists in the establishment press, and I know that this is an issue that's been talked to death to some extent, but so many journalists are not standing up for Assange, they're engaging this propaganda war against him, against their own interests. Is there anything that will make them wake up to the reality of this situation? I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. And I think, I think that that's because of the, the takeover of the American media by uh, corporate interests. You know, almost no outlets have a budget, for example, for investigative journalism anymore. You have to turn to the likes of, of ProPublica or, well, I hate to even say it, but The Intercept, uh, and, and WikiLeaks for real investigative journalism. So I think that, uh, that by and large, mainstream uh, journalists either don't have the wherewithal or the fire in the belly necessary to cover these important issues. I think that they're told what to cover, and they're largely content doing that. And well, the CNN, yeah, no, well, actually the CNN, I remember recently uh, in the result, in the wake of the Mueller uh, report, you know, Fuhrer, uh, I believe it was an editor from CNN, said, we're not investigators, we, we're right. reporters, and that, thing, that it was admitting that exact point, so. Ridiculous. Absolutely. So, but uh, yeah, oh, go ahead if you're gonna say something. I was gonna say, that's why it's always such blockbuster news when they come up with something that's mildly interesting because now investigative journalism is so rare that that, that journalism in and of itself is news. 
that's the sad state we're in. It's extremely sad, and it's been monopolized and controlled uh, for for uh, by so, so so few people. You know, you look at outlets like the Washington Post, owned by Jeff Bezos, contract with the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's it's mind numbing the degree to which the media is not the media; it is just mouthpieces of power. Mm -hmm. So, but. Well, I know that uh, the, initially when Julian Assange was silenced last year, just over a year ago by Ecuador, um, you delivered a number of petitions to the Ecuadorian embassy, I believe in DC. Um, yes. Do you have any, are there any plan, if you're willing to share it, are there any plans to do similar, uh, a similar act uh, in, uh, in the result of the pre uh, recent news from Ecuador or? Uh, we haven't discussed, when I say we, I mean, uh, those of us from veteran intelligence professionals for sanity haven't discussed it in the last two days, but yeah, the time is ripe. We need to do it now, like this weekend immediately. And I'm happy to take the lead on that. Uh, that's what we did last year. We wrote a letter to the Ecuadorian uh, president uh, through the Ecuadorian embassy here in Washington. We had something like three or four dozen signatures of uh, retired intelligence professionals from CIA, NSA, FBI, Homeland Security, and the Uniformed Military and Military Intelligence Services. Uh, so we like to think, you know, we're a group of people who know what we're talking about. We were received very warmly in the, in the Ecuadorian Embassy here in Washington. Uh, I like to think that the letter had some, some impact. Uh, I'm not sure, but at the very least it didn't hurt. And as you said, yeah, now's the time to, to do it again with even more support and more signatures. Well, I, I wish you all luck in, in delivering that and writing that because I think it is, it is important. It's another way of raising our collective voices. And you know, speaking of VIPs and veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, um, I remember uh, when Gina Haspel was nominated CIA director by, Tr uh, by Trump, you and other VIPs members wrote very vociferously about, against that nomination. And I bring that up because I want to ask you to explain to our audience, you know, not, I don't, I'm not asking you to go on a rant against Trump for like a political like statement, but I just want to ask you to explain to the people that really do support WikiLeaks and Assange, but who think that Trump will bring him to the US and pardon him or, you know, free him or have a fair trial. Can you please explain to them how the nomination of people like Gina Haspel, Elliot Abrams, John Bolton, et cetera, show a different picture than they seem to think exists. That point I think is probably the most important, but I, I will tell you this. I actually have some access to the White House right now. Um, awesome. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I do. It's quite expensive access, but it's access nonetheless. Enough of that. Uh, with my point being, one of the, the most important things I've learned in this whole process of trying to gain access to the president is that the president really is malleable. The thing is, is, and this is just his personality, he needs to hear something from three different people. If he hears from Elizabeth Voss that Julian Assange ought to be pardoned, he's not gonna pay five seconds of attention to you. If he hears it from you and from me, he's still not gonna pay any attention. But if he hears it from the two of us, and somebody that he plays golf with at Mar-a-Lago on the weekends, he might actually do something. And so you remember as well as I do when he said during the campaign, and I quote, God bless WikiLeaks. Right. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he's willing to be um, uh, convinced. Uh, now, you raise something that I think is critically important, uh, and that is the list of what I believe to be very, very dangerous neoconservatives appointed to some of the most important national security positions in government. Uh, he was clearly influenced by other neocons in those, in those uh, nominations. And so if he can be influenced one way, I believe actually that he can be influenced in another way as well. It's just a question of getting to him. Now, we can't pick up the phone and call Donald Trump, but we can, continue to write and to shout and to try to influence people who do have access to Donald Trump. You know, there are a lot of Republicans out there who 
support WikiLeaks and who support Julian. If not for uh, his, his position on civil liberties, then because they view him as an opponent of Hillary Clinton's. I don't care why people support Julian, so long as they support him. I don't care what their, what their basis is, just so long as the outcome is, is right. So maybe we actually do have a chance here. That is the most optimistic and, and positive um, take on that that I could possibly imagine. I think you know my uh, thoughts going into that that question were you know very kind of pessimistic, negative. And, right. Yeah, exactly. Like there's no hope that 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 Trump would change his mind on this this issue. But I think you it is a really great point that he obviously is malleable since he has flip flopped on WikiLeaks thus far at least yes. once. He has. He's flip-flopped on WikiLeaks, and I, I think that's a good thing. You, you know, um, an aide to Trump um, mentioned me to him about six months ago, and um, he paid no attention whatsoever. But then Rand Paul mentioned him to me, went, mentioned me to him about two weeks later, and he said, you know, Joe Smith mentioned this guy to me a couple of weeks ago. So now that's two people. So I know that this is true, what I've been told, that he needs to hear something from three different people, three different people he respects, and he's willing to actually change his mind. That is the most optimistic thing I've heard all day. And I think that that's really, that should, should motivate the Republican and Trump supporting audience to get out there exactly and raise right. their voices. Exactly the, the, right. Yeah. The Let's only talk. problem I see, the only problem I see is that there, ha there is a quadrant of those people that have been pacified by things like QAnon and other, other uh, thought patterns where they believe that they don't have to do anything, that Trump is in control and he'll save the day. Right. That has to be kind of addressed in order to get them fired up to try to change yes. his mind. Yes, because that's just simply not true. Um, and and that, that weakens us if people believe things like uh, QAnon. Yeah, that weakens us. But we need to get to the likes of Mike Lee, Republican senator from Utah, or Rand Paul, a Republican from, from Kentucky, or Mark Meadows, who's the chairman of the, the House uh, Tea Party Caucus. We need, to get, we need to get close to Republicans who believe that this is a civil liberties issue and not a criminal one. They're the ones who can really influence uh, the president much, much more effectively than we can. Yeah, no doubt whatsoever. Um, yeah, so again, I think that that's a really positive sentiment. I'm really glad that you raised it. And I hope that people that are watching that have been, you know, maybe pissed off at myself and others who have been critical of Trump on this stream, I hope that they will be fired up to go out and do exactly that, to raise their voices from that uh, conservative perspective. But that is one of the strengths of the Unity 4J Vigils is that we do openly welcome support from, from all, all um, parts of the political spectrum. And let me say one more thing about that too, Elizabeth. Uh, I was very pessimistic for a long time and then Jeff Sessions left. And so I think that we've got a better chance now because William Barr is a functionary. He's a, a bureaucrat and a paper pusher. He's not an ideologue like Jeff Session was. And so maybe perhaps the guy might be willing to be convinced. We have to at least give it a try. Completely agree, completely agree. Uh, so based on that more um, optimistic view of, of the president, of the possibility that he would change his mind, uh, what do you see, like, can you just give maybe, maybe a kind of speculative forecast of what you see happening in the future now that we have, now that WikiLeaks has exposed Ecuador's plans, now that it, at least right now they haven't expelled Assange from the embassy, what do you see happening going forward? That's one of the toughest questions you've ever asked me. Honestly, I think it's so fluid that anything could happen. And, and we, ought to, we ought to treat that as an opportunity. You know, we ought, to, we ought to be talking, for example, publicly about the notion that Julian could return to Australia, or perhaps Julian could go to Iceland or to Moscow or to, I, somebody mentioned Geneva the other day. Uh, so 
I, I think that it's it's really not over until it's over. I, I think that there are ideas that ought to be debated publicly. I think that Americans need to be convinced that um, that this ought not to be a criminal issue. Uh, we need people to listen to the argument that Dan Ellsberg has so eloquently made for the for the last several years that the Espionage Act is unconstitutionally broad and ought to be challenged, uh, which it has not been. And so uh, I, I'll repeat myself. I, I think we may have a we may have a, a, a path to uh, to justice here. That is an interesting point. I, I can see what you're saying. I really, I understand that in the sense that we're looking at a, at a field right now that is more open than it's ever been in multiple different ways, whether it's, as you say, the fact that uh, Jeff Sessions is no longer the attorney general, the fact that we, you know, there's this instability in the government of Lenin Moreno, and there is a pessimistic outlook on that. If you, you know, if you consider the fact that Lenin Moreno could be replaced by somebody farther to the right and more of a lackey to the US than Moreno already is. Yes. But it's still, as you say, it's still an opportunity that everything is so fluid right now in lots of different uh, layers of, of the kind of context is. of all this. I think it is. And Joe Loria is making a point right now that, that Rudy Giuliani is apparently already making that argument, that this is a press issue, not a criminal issue. And I, I think that's exactly right. I can't believe I'm <laughs> agreeing with yeah. Rudy Giuliani. Exactly. But that's exactly right. This is a press issue. Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like a broken record again. Please let's do. Talk, let's talk for just a, a couple of minutes about the Espionage Act. It's the it's the Espionage Act of 1917. This was an act written to combat German saboteurs during the First World War. Okay, it is so old and so outdated that it doesn't even mention the words classified information. It uses the term national defense information because when it was written and updated, the classification system didn't even exist yet. The classification system was invented in the mid 1950s. So that shows you how old this thing is. It is so broadly written that in my view, it's unconstitutional. It's so broadly written that someone like Barack Obama can charge eight whistleblowers with espionage for speaking to the media. Well, that wasn't the intent of the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act was meant to punish people who were spying for foreign countries. Well, I think Julian's even more innocent of espionage than I was. And all of my espionage charges were dropped because clearly I hadn't committed espionage. Clearly Julian hasn't committed espionage. This is indeed a press and media issue. That's the narrative that we need to just keep hitting over and over and over again. This is not about espionage. It's about press freedom. Absolutely. And I think if, if you know, in the pessimistic, um, you know, possibility of, uh, of Assange being not only ex expelled, extradited and prosecuted, but, you know, convicted, you know, that would be, and I think that's why it seems like such an epic moment, because that would really represent the prosecution and the the conviction of the free press, because Julian, and I, I, that's what I'm asking yeah. you to comment on, is that Julian Assange is not just one person who is a publisher, a journalist who is unfairly accused of espionage and all of these different things. He is, as you said earlier, the most accurate publisher of our generation, if not ever. So he represents so much more than just himself and WikiLeaks. And, and if you can please expand on that, that would be fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, where do we even start with something yeah. like, you know, I think the most important point is that if Julian were to be prosecuted successfully, that would open the door for the Justice Department to prosecute literally any journalist who printed uh, classified information in an article, it would expose any news outlet, uh, including its publishers, to espionage charges for publishing any information that the government considered to be national defense or, or classified. It would, it would be the end of a free press in the United States. And I, I really believe I'm not overstating that. 
That's how important this case is. As I said a half an hour ago, this is one of those once in a generation cases that, that our children are gonna be reading about in history books. And that's why we have to get it right. Absolutely. And it's not just in the country, across the globe, national security and international affairs uh, journalists that are in those areas would fear being prosecuted by the United States because Assange oh. is not an American citizen. And they would know from that precedent that the First Amendment would not extend to them in the eyes of the U U.S. That's so, right. I mean, that's right. And in addition to that, in addition to that, you think the British government isn't watching this? Do you think the French aren't watching to see how this plays out? or the Israelis, or even maybe the Chinese. Everybody's gonna see, or are looking, they're looking to see if the Justice Department can get away with successfully prosecuting a journalist on an espionage charge, because I would bet a paycheck if, if this prosecution is successful, they're gonna turn around and do exactly the same thing. And in that sense, it would be almost, you know, the death of the pretense of the West's ideals of liberalism and uh, you know, all of that that we've grown up with those myths that we have in childhood, that the, the West believes in that, that would be the absolute um, implosion of that idea. That's um, it, everything would change. And the prosecution of yourself and others has shown that the reality is not what we're told as far as justice in the US and all of that. But I think that what we would see is the death of the pretense of those ideals, I guess. Um, That's so. right. You know, there was a case that uh, that received just about no media coverage here in the U.S. three years ago. Uh, there was a woman who was a journalist for The Washington Times, and she was married to an official at the Department of Education. One morning at 6 a.m., uh, armed federal agents broke down the door of their house and seized not just their computer, but also files. Now, this was an armed SWAT team of the Department of Education. So most Americans don't have any idea that the Department of Education has an armed SWAT team that will bust your door down at six o'clock in the morning. They actually do, as does the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Labor and other governmental organizations. The, the dirty little secret about federal law enforcement. So not only did they take this, uh, this couple's computer saying that the husband had um, uh, governmental proprietary information on the computer. They took his wife's notes. Now, she's a working journalist for the for the Washington Times. They took her notes and they wouldn't give them back. And so there was no criminal prosecution at the end of the day. And then she had to sue the government civilly to recover her notes, a working journalist. Now, for whatever reason, no other journalist paid any attention in this case. And now here we are where a journalist is being prosecuted uh, and, and a journalistic entity is being prosecuted. Well, there's already kind of a, a precedent for seizing a journalist's uh, protected uh, notes and the names of sources. So we have ourselves, I mean, not us on this, on this telecast, but as Americans, we have ourselves to blame for not putting our foot down when, when these rights began to be whittled away and say, no, we have constitutional protections. We didn't do that. And now we find ourselves in this predicament. Yeah, I think for myself and maybe others, you know, growing up, you assume that those things just can't happen. And so when you don't what? hear about them, you assume that they're not happening. But yeah, when something like that happens and it's so unconstitutional to such a huge degree, but that doesn't get press coverage, you know, that really does go a long way to continuing that false sense of, I guess, security and safety. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I yeah, just go ahead. always assumed that um, that adults always knew what was best, right? They're adults. They they have educations and they have experience and, and they know right from wrong. And so they know what's best. And then, you know, by the time I was an adult, I was working on Capitol Hill. And I remember walking with a colleague through the tunnel connecting the Senate Russell office building to uh, the Capitol building and Mitch McConnell was walking toward us. And my colleague leaned over and he said, do you want to punch him or should I? And, uh, you know, I, that's kind of an attitude that I've adopted here in Washington. I've lived in Washington for 37 years, minus two for prison. But, uh, but that, that's, that's my view now is that 
we adults oftentimes don't know what's best. We don't know right from wrong. We act rashly, not logically. We, we act uh, for short-term gain rather than what's in the best interests of the country. And, uh, and that's got to stop. Now, of course, it, it won't stop because it's human nature. So it's up to people like us to ensure that it, uh, that it does as little damage as possible. This is one of those unique opportunities that we can actually do good. Yeah, and exactly. And I think at, le- at the very least, we can shine a light on that rash um, you know, action and that the um, you know, inconsistent behavior that we see happening. Um, we have a few minutes left. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience or just address in general that we haven't uh, discussed yet? You know, I'm going to say I, I've been very fortunate to have spoken with Julian a couple of times over the phone, but I've never met the man in person. Uh, that doesn't matter to me one whit. I am going to be out there in the street. I'm going to be writing about this. I'm going to go to the courthouse. If I have to take vacation time, I'm going to go to the courthouse and to be there. And I encourage literally everybody who is who is watching us tonight to do the same thing. We have to stand together. You know, without without that unity and that solidarity, we have nothing. I, no, I, com- I, I, I completely agree. <laughs> Yeah, Joe just asked uh, asked John uh, who punched who punched Mitch McConnell. So <laughs> he doesn't know how close he came, Joe. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I think that's an absolutely inspiring message, though, and I think that that I mean, I I myself will have to travel to if a, a expulsion and arrest happens, I will travel to DC and, and cover it myself. And I would hope that everyone else in the United States and maybe internationally would join us in doing that and and protesting. I mean, we know that there is enough anger amongst the populace at at this overall corrupt plutocratic system, whether they come at it from a right-wing perspective or a left-wing perspective, the public is angry. And in France, for the yellow vests, we're seeing that persistent energy come to that issue. And we're seeing that, uh, as you said, uh, you know, in, in Venezuela, we're seeing the same thing. We have to make that happen for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. It's just not going to be successful unless we do. You know, this this comparison that you make to the yellow vests, I think, is very appropriate. Uh, I heard somebody just recently describe the yellow vest movement as a leftist movement. It's not at all leftist. Um, Some of them are leftists. Some of them are rightists. They're all angry. That's the important thing. And that that's us. It doesn't matter if you're approaching this from the right or the left. If you're angry enough that that you believe that Julian Assange should not be prosecuted, then meet us at the courthouse. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And that's, that is exactly the the reason that I chose that comparison, because it is the exact same uh, visceral anger and bipartisanship that, that is motivating the yellow vest that needs to motivate this movement for sure. That's right. That's right. We'll Thank do it. you. Thank you, John, for joining Thanks us once happy. again. It's always an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Go ahead. Pleasure's mine. Happy to do it. Thank you. And I'm sure we will see you again, and hopefully it will continue to be in positive, optimistic circumstances. That's right. I look forward to that. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Thank you.